Good afternoon. We might make we might make a start. My name is Heather Zwicker. I am the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, and I am more excited to be here than I can probably properly express in words. Let me begin with an acknowledgement of country and pay respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet at this particular bend in the, uh, in the Maiwa River and pay uh, respects to elders past and present and uh, express how appreciative I am for all of the ways in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people enrich the learning that we do in this university, in this faculty, and indeed in the, in the arena of digital humanities and social sciences and culture every day. Welcome. Walking in here this afternoon took me back to a moment in early 2019. So you can think back before masks and back before pandemics and back before we had any funding. And what we did is we convened, a, we, I, I was pretty new in my role, and I brought together a series of people to do short lightning talks around the theme of humanities for the future. And the rough mandate for everybody at that time, mandate meant something different at that time, I will say. <laughs> I've since learned not to really use that word because it's a bit of a trigger word, but the mandate of that, the, the, the remit that I gave people at that time was to describe your work. What would a, what would a, what would a good person do in your area? with an eye on the future. And people did incredible presentations. It was incredibly uplifting to be in this room and hear from the different perspectives the kind of work that people were engaged in. And one of the key areas that emerged was a lot of work in the area of digital humanities and social sciences. And I thought, yes, this is something that we can build around in this faculty. What we need is a bit of wind in our sails, which of course in universities is code for resourcing. Took a long time, a couple of VCs, a few visits to the strategic initiatives funding round, and but we have but we have come here today with a launch event that represents uh, that represents the beginning of a digital cultures and societies hub. And I am actually going to pause. Did, is that music in? Is that is that in my head or is that is it outside? <laughs> Why does digital cultures and societies matter? It's because we are surrounded by digital, including in the implants in our own minds. That's what I was worried I was, gonna, I was gonna say. So why does this matter? And why does it matter at a university like this? This is a university that does an incredible amount of research across all kinds of disciplines. It's often recognized as a STEM important university. We get rankings that show how good we are across science, technology, engineering, medicine, mathematics. We are also extremely good in the humanities and social sciences and what the last couple of years of pandemic have demonstrated is that absolutely none of the aspirations that are articulated in and through STEM can be realized without attention to those groundbreaking questions, those fundamental questions that come out of humanities, social sciences and the arts. How shall we be together as a society, what do we think community is? What measures are we prepared to take to look after ourselves and one another? These are, and how can we imagine ourselves into different environments? How will we tell our stories to one another? All of those are the questions that are just at the very root of humanities and social sciences. And the argot of the day is the digital. And the need that we have is to really bring these things together and have the digital means combined with the fundamental tools of our disciplines in a way that enables more recognizably our work to flourish. That was really the idea that we had when we started thinking about the Digital Cultures and Societies Hub. What we know is that digital media and technologies 
transform cultural experiences, relationships, and social institutions. They translate our movements and our expressions into data. They afford new modes of expression, and they change how we understand ourselves and each other. These changes are not just technical in nature, because even while we bring our fundamental disciplinary affordances to our technologies, our technologies are changing the way that we understand ourselves, they change the way that we understand our world, and they change the way that we understand our being and our existence in that world. Our aim in this DCS, in the Digital Cultures and Societies Lab, is to build capacity and leadership in digital cultures and societies research at UQ, and to make UQ a key node in national and international research networks, infrastructure, and research centers and projects. That's what we're here to do. We are already underway, and this is the moment where we take a moment, to, where we stop and celebrate that venture. I am so proud of the people, all of you, some people online, I hope you're feeling better if you're watching the live stream or if you're watching this after the fact. I know that we've lost a lot of people currently to COVID and to influenza, various kinds of bugs that are out there, not just computer bugs. Um, but I am very grateful to the, some of the people who have done a lot of heavy lifting and I do have some thanks that I wanna issue. Um, the first is actually to, um, to Greg Marston and David Mayoki, who know that there was a very, very dark moment where I just thought, I will not ever be able to explain what we do in humanities and social sciences and the digital in a way that the VC's strategic funding initiatives funders will understand. I had done it three times, and those two people gave me the courage to go back and explain it a fourth time. <laughs> so thank you very much, Greg, and thank you very much, David, for that. Um, everybody in the faculty research office, Anne-Marie, Rachel, the whole fro has been so incredibly supportive in getting this off the ground to begin with and supporting the whole venture as we start to get it launched. Thank you. Um, I, think, I can't actually see, is Rachel? Where are you? I, I, have, I have terrible facial recognition, which I don't know if that's good or bad if you try and launch a digital cultures in society. But anyway, the whole fro, thank you. You guys are amazing. And Nick, you are the right person to be leading this. Thank you for stepping forward and taking this on. I know that it's been a massive um, amount of work. Thank you for, for doing that. And finally, to all of you who have the imagination and take the, the affordances and capabilities and the mad ideas that you have and find your way into this. A center without a real specific locus and imagine in and through this how we might do our work better. This, is, this day is for you. Thank you for your trust in this and thank you for coming today. I'm gonna to turn it over to you Nick. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, and, and, and thank you, uh, Heather, for, the, for that, uh, I guess, official launch of our centre. I uh, also uh, want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we meet on today and recognise their contributions to our society and, of course, to our intellectual community. Um, Digital Cultures and Societies launches today a five-year program funded uh, um, with strategic support from the Vice-Chancellor and the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. And as Heather has said, this is a generational investment in humanities and social sciences research at a time when digital technologies are transforming our homes, our cities, our relationships, feelings, bodies, our efforts to build a world together. Uh, and we've been trying to put this vision into action since January, and I want to kind of do a recap, I guess, of what we've been doing already this year. Uh, we funded projects exploring algorithmic recommendation on Google and Facebook, uh, cutting-edge text analytics on social media, the perceptions and practices of AI developers, uh, queer digital storytelling, and the techno-social relationships of supply chains and logistics hubs. 
Uh, we've also launched a scheme to enable Haas researchers to work with community and industry partners in novel ways, and we're in the progress, a process of recruiting our first three postdoctoral fellows. We've hosted lightning talks earlier in the year uh, with 20 or 30 really wonderful talks and an event uh, last week on gender, tech, digital technology and consent. And uh, we were recapping this up in the hub last week. Before the year is out, we're going to host events on misinformation, the transformation of media industries by platforms, digital research methods and storytelling, social services and automated decision making, transactional digital cultures in Asia, and, and cultures and histories of automation. So you're going to be hearing from us <laughs> before the end of the year. Um, We've begun developing digital research training for humanities and social science research students across methods, analytics, storytelling, and translation. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we're kicking off a student partner project with some of our most creative undergraduate students in digital media, writing, art history, and film to develop a concept design for a project for the digital humanities. We're gonna be asking what role do we have to play in telling stories and animating accounts of our digital cultures using digital forms of storytelling. Uh, and we've begun to contribute to national efforts with other colleagues at UQ to build the next generation of humanities and social sciences research infrastructure. Um, in undertaking all this work, I also have some thanks to make. I must uh, acknowledge also the extraordinary uh, team I'm already working with in the hub, first and foremost, Rachel Smith as our coordinator, uh, and a team of uh, PhD students, Meg Thomas, Katie McHugh, and Maria Brown, who bring their own research agendas that traverse digital death, vibes, and aesthetics. What I'm thinking of is the three auras of the digital cultures. <laughs> um, it's wonderful to already be working with this next generation of researchers and have them shape our work uh, across digital research training, engagement, and events from the get-go. Uh, importantly, a big thank you, uh, Heather, for your leadership uh, and the faculty executive for their support of this initiative. Uh, as you said, it was 2019 we were in this room for Humanities for the Future. Uh, where we first really set out some of this agenda, and it's been quite an adventure since then to, to bring it to life. Um, from the moment you arrived at UQ, you've really advocated for this, uh, for this research agenda, um, and also Professor Greg Mars and Anne-Marie Carroll and the faculty team have been behind us all the way. Um, and I also want to thank Sandra Fasara and the Hass Engagement Team for your work in planning and delivering this event. As anyone who tries to make an event happen at the moment knows, it is an acrobatic <laughs> undertaking. Uh, so thank you. Um, and finally, I also want to express my gratitude for the generous, uh, enthusiastic, creative ways in which colleagues across our faculty have engaged with us in the first few months to bring this initiative into being. Um, and also for the many, many colleagues uh, here tonight, here before us, uh, who held and nurtured the vision for a bold initiative in digital cultures and societies over many years and kept arguing for it. Uh, we are building on that work, and we're also building on the deep foundation of contemporary humanities research here at UQ, um, and it's an honour to continue that tradition. Uh, to move toward introducing our, our wonderful speaker for tonight, um, let me say digital cultures and societies for me is at the heart of what a humanities for the future must be. Uh, sometimes the stock image printed on a banner, slides and stickers of a research centre over here, uh, doesn't mean all that much, and maybe this purple pixelated glitchy cloud doesn't. But when my searches in a stock image database that UQ subscribes to returned a version of it, it reminded me a little of uh, John Durham Peters' The Marvelous Clouds, where he eloquently explains that digital technologies are the craft, the medium, the atmosphere in which we sustain our lives. Mm -hmm. To imagine us without digital technologies, to imagine sailors without ships, astronauts without spacesuits. He reminds us too that digital technologies follow in a long history of the tools that we use to record, transmit, and process culture to manage the flow of people, objects, and ideas, to organize time, space, and power. Before the neural network is the register, the index, the census, the calendar, the catalog, the library, and so on. In his way of thinking, the questions that automated societies and digital cultures generate are not only challenges of inventing and adjusting and tuning the equipment, they are questions about how we orchestrate collective being and they require imagination and creativity. Searching a stock image database also gets you thinking about culture in the era of algorithmic processing. The endless scrolling options start to make all the images feel unreal and interchangeable. And pondering this, and wishing the library had variations of the not quite right images I was finding, I asked Adali 2, an AI image generator trained to create images from text and image prompts, to create an image for our center uh, of the purple pixelated clouds. Uh, I asked it for an image of uh, purple pixelated clouds at a sandstone university. You'll see it in a second. Um, I gave it a stock image and asked it to generate endless variations of it. All these images scrolling here are synthetic images created by a neural network. They prompt us to think about the rapidly emerging culture we lived in, we live in, 
filled with algorithmically recommended and synthetically generated words, images, and symbols. The humanities, of course, can see that these images are not synthetic at all. Images like these are possible because of the history of human labor, creativity, and material resources that underpin them. There is no DALI 2, no neural network, without all of the images and ideas and texts that humans create, digitize, upload, share on the internet over the past several decades. We live in a period where to inhabit digital cultures is to find ourselves and our efforts to make meaning, to affect one another, to organize life together is increasingly entangled with data processing machines and automated models. These are among the questions that will animate our work in digital cultures and societies. And tonight, building on these themes of the relationship between automation and human experience, uh, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Frank Pasquale. Uh, Professor Fr uh, Pasquale's talk, Interrogating Emotion Machines, Five Critiques of Effective Computing, will explain the rise of effective computing and its consequences for our emotional lives. Frank is an expert on the law of artificial intelligence, algorithms, and machine learning. And before coming to Brooklyn Law, he was Piper and Marbury Professor of Law at the University of Maryland. He's an affiliate fellow at Yale University's Information Society Project. And he currently serves on the US National Artificial Intelligence Advisory Committee, which advises the President and the National AI Office at the Department of Commerce. His work on algorithmic accountability has helped bring the insights and demands of social justice movements to AI law and policy. And his books, The Black Box Society and New Laws of Robotics, from, both from Harvard University Press, have shaped international debates about automation and artificial intelligence. Uh, Professor Pasquale's work as a partner investigator with the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society has brought him to Australia and today to UQ uh, for a conversation earlier today with ADMS researchers, which was really wonderful. Uh, and, and, and for our talk tonight, we're very fortunate to host you in Brisbane and at UQ, uh, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to talk tonight. Thanks, for, Frank. Well, thank you. Oops. <laughs> thank you so much. This is really uh, just such a great uh, honor and pleasure to be here at such a world-leading institution in the realm of digital humanities and digital research and, and humanities and social sciences. And I just am greatly appreciative of everyone coming out tonight for what I hope will be a really interesting and, and uh, engaging uh, conversation uh, uh, afterward about the nature of our emotions and how emotion machines may be creating a different reality, a different affect of reality for us, and how we can respond to that. So to start with, what I want to do is uh, just show a little image by Ben Grosser. Uh, this is uh, uh, an image by Ben Grosser of uh, various um, uh, Facebook reaction buttons. And what I love about Grosser's work uh, as an artist is that he has combined artistic practice with humanities research with a policy awareness of the future of how platforms are affecting how we feel. And this sort of uh, overlay of massive numbers of reaction buttons to me is, just offers a clue, a beginning of a clue, about the way in which the effort to capture and to stimulate emotion may in some ways be a prelude to a certain uh, derangement of emotion, you know, or a certain sort of disorganization of emotional feelings. And the chaotic energy here, I think, is quite powerful. So uh, I also recommend uh, Grosser's work, uh, The Demetricator, which takes numbers off of social media. Uh, it leads us to think about what happens when we don't know how many people liked our photos, or, you know, had any, or followed uh, us on Twitter, or uh, hearted a tweet. So with that, I just wanted to, uh, leave that to, to begin with something out of the arts, but now into the body of the talk, which is you know, the affective computing landscape. We all know that volumes like, um, sorry, I'll move this over here, uh, volumes like the Oxford Act Handbook of Affective Computing, they describe teams that are available out there today that are programming robots, chatbots, and animations to appear to express sadness, empathy, curiosity, and much more. I say appear to express, and this is something I hope you'll watch for in my talk, that uh, uh, if I ever say express, correct me, because I think that there's something very unique about human embodiment and sort of the unique human predicament of being in a body that is a necessary predicate for actual expression of emotion. Of course, we can debate that later on, but I just wanted to put that out there as one of my assumptions, one of the, the predicates for this talk. 
Um, as part of affective computing, automated face analysis is translating countless images of human expressions into standardized code that elicits, elicits certain responses from machines. So for example, with respect to Facebook's uh, efforts to uh, uh, help curb and address the problem of suicide and suicidal ideation in America, certain patterns of posting on Facebook will be taken as an indicator or a tell of suicidal ideation, which will in turn lead to a wellness check, at least in the US, that could be conducted by police officers. So this is a way in which affective computing, sort of the computational assessment of emotion, is becoming very important and is leading to real material changes in individuals' lives. Um, I'd like to say it's leading to changes for the better, but unfortunately, there's been no systematic evaluation of these interventions. So we really need to, to do something like that soon. Um, as affective computing is slowly adopted in many areas, it's going to increasingly judge us and try to manipulate us. But what I should also note here is that there is some forms of affective computing that are like therapeutic interventions, uh, particularly for uh, 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 neurodivergent or autistic individuals. I'm not addressing those tonight. I'm addressing affective computing in, in the main for large populations of individuals. And so that's, that's not in a therapeutic context. So I wanna just put that off as a disclaimer. The tools of affective computing include categorization of emotion, quantification of emotion, and binarization of affect. And all the, what I mean here is categorization can be something as simple as the Facebook reaction buttons, right? When you see something, how do you feel about it? Quantification is, you know, how many loves versus ha-has versus wows versus sads showed up, right? So that's gonna be an important aspect of um, trying to figure out how is something actually being received in the world. Binarization of affect is the simplest tool here where essentially everything is crunched down into engagement. So in general, it might be the case that we want more likes, loves, ha-has, and less sads and angries, right? And so this is a very interesting idea here, but binarization of affect suggests something like the basic crude benthamite pleasure-pain dichotomy. Maybe we could crunch all of emotion into, say, a zero to 100 of the least uh, engaging experience and the most engaging, right? And so that, I think, is part of the dream here, it's rooted in a philosophical foundation that goes all the way back to Marvin Minsky. So if you go to Minsky's book, The Emotion Machine, one of the things he asks about in the, in the, in the book is, how does imagination work? What are the causes of consciousness? What are emotions, feelings, and thoughts? Okay. Well, how do we answer a question like that? I mean, certainly there are lots of people in humanities and social sciences and the arts that have done amazing jobs trying to answer these questions. I think of the work of Robert Solomon, or Martha Nussbaum on the philosophy of emotion. I think of the work of Lisa Feldman Barrett in psychology, just amazing work there. But where Minsky goes is, and I think this is where a lot of affective computing goes, is toward a metaphor of science and natural science. And the question there is, he contrasts these questions that are enduring over time with the pros progress we've seen toward answering questions about physical things. What are solids, liquids, and gases? What are forces, stress, and strains? Okay. All those mysteries have been explained. And his goal is to explain, in a way, be able to control and predict emotion in human beings. Right? That could sort of be an ideal of affective computing. So I want to question these philosophical foundations. I mean, I do realize they're tempting. right? I mean, if we think of this, look at this particular uh, image from Microsoft, we see that there are efforts to code images as being either uh, neutral, happy, surprised, sad, angered, disgusted, feared, or contemptuous. Sometimes this is easy to do, right? I mean, this is a relatively straightforward example of there's surprise. And we can understand surprise in the person's eyes, in their mouth, and other sort of areas like that. Although Feldman Barrett would also ask us to consider that sometimes people may make this face without being surprised. They may be faking surprise. We don't really know. And what's fascinating is that in some of these databases, the core benchmark image for a given emotion is actually from an actor pulling a face, okay? So this should already lead us to some concerns about exactly how well these image databases are going to represent people. And we, I haven't even got into the question of diverse cultures and uh, experiences. Um, but the stakes can be very high, right? We can imagine a future where a chain of stores may eventually record its customers for thousands of hours to develop a database of their intentions. Of course, it's a big issue with self-checkout now that we don't want to have more shrinkage or you know, people just locking off of the stuff. And so 
they may find that there's, say, a certain way that people may act, you know, sort of shiftily, like, you know, before they walk out of the Woolworths with something. And that may lead to a database of intentions and a database of suspicion, right? And if we have, say, subroutines within these systems that either dispatch an assistant manager to attend to an aggravated customer or an armed security guard to approach an enraged or suspicious ones, that is a classification with immediate and very important consequences. And this is one reason why Jennifer Bard and some other researchers have proposed that we need a legal framework immediately to regulate emotional AI. Under the EU AI Act, emotion AI, I think, believe right now, is not quite in the high risk category. Um, so it's really, the, the vision there is it's not going to be terribly uh, deeply regulated. But part of the premise of this talk is that we need to do a lot more. Um, also, the emotion, the affective computing is not just about reading, but writing emotion, okay? So brands can use AI to develop loyalty, even love from customers. There's whole uh, uh, sub-literature and marketing on love brands, okay? Um, customer relationship management via large-scale parsing of this data could lead to this. Joseph Thoreau describes in some of uh, his work the way in which companies can distinguish between the wooed and the waste. The wooed are the customers we want to develop relationships with. The waste is we don't care about them. Okay. And so you might send the waste, you could use a voice parsing algorithm to send your waste customers to the, your worst customer service representatives, your wooed ones to the best, right? Top of the line. And so, and, and of course the political goals of firms like Cambridge Analytica are clear too, and I'll get into that later on. Now, here is the theoretical structure. And I should note that everything I've said so far and some of my examples, I've developed in an article in Real Life magazine called um, uh, More Than a Feeling. Um, but uh, in terms of classifying these effective computing concerns, developing uh, an idea or ideas for today's presentation, I think that I wanted to classify them into four different areas. And I think that the problems for effective computing are often that, it's, first I classify its effects as reading emotion, making people legible to machines, and writing emotion, making people malleable thanks to machines, right? So the machine can, mal can change how you feel. And I think that when, and sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes we worry that it will work too well. So our, we're gonna first go over, when it doesn't work in reading emotion, there is misrecognition of emotion. This is where a lot of the attention is right now. When it uh, works too well in terms of reading emotion, we worry about privacy invasion. And this is something that I have to admit is of some personal interest because I have a terrible poker face. Like, if I, if I don't like something, I often just like look, look angry, you know? <laughs> and so I feel like people that are, are more composed have a great advantage over me in life. So, uh, and, and I worry about this aspect of computing, you know, that, but, but of course this could level the playing field, so maybe I should want it, I don't know, um, right? But that's sort of on reading emotion. On writing emotion, when it doesn't work, I think we face the problem of alienation. And you know, this is a, a term with a terrific history. You know, I mean, the term of alienation goes back to Marxian work, but of course there's been lots of critical theory on that. It fell out of favor for a while, but more recently, I mean, theorists like Rahel Yagi and um, Hartmut Rosa and others have really developed an idea of alienation, and we can understand this as a feeling of meaninglessness and powerlessness. We don't want our technology to make us feel powerless, and yet when it tries to write emotion or make us feel a certain way and it fails, we can feel alienated. And finally, if it works too well at writing emotion, we have a problem that uh, Julie Cohen, a US researcher, social theorist, and legal academic has called modulation. It could make people act in certain ways that we wouldn't want that regimentation. So let's get into the concrete here. Misrecognition, faulty reading of emotion. This is where most of the action is, right? Um, James Vincent had a great article uh, building on the work of Lisa Feldman Barrett, the psychologist, showing that facial expressions really don't reliably correspond to emotions. So if we have a world where we're consistently relying on this sort of effective computing to identify, say, uh, depressed individuals or individuals that may need some help or whatever it might be, that there's a problem in terms of, or just how people are feeling, that there's this problem of misrecognition. The other thing that I think is critical here is to ask whether is effective computing reading emotions or attributing them, right? Is, this, is it sort of, are we really legible to it? And I think that it's important to challenge this uh, idea of legibility. Because since psychology researchers have demonstrated that faces and expressions don't necessarily map neatly onto particular traits and emotions, that it should be an initial disqualification of affective computing as an aggression detector, right? That's one issue. Also, 
Um, Feldman Barrett says that the communicative capacities of the face are limited. So even if you try, you may not succeed in getting yourself read by the machine. And I'm sure you know, we've all had frustrations with phone trees. Imagine the affective phone tree. You're trying to get to a certain point in the, in the, you know, to an operator and you just can't do it. Right? Now, the other thing too is I think that you know, this is a clear and present danger because aggravated and enraged uh, in, in classifications have already um, gone into aggression detectors in schools. Uh, this is, I don't think, coming outside the US, but given the problem of school violence, I'm sure everyone has seen the Uvalde shooting in the US, there's a concern about early identification of um, aggravated or potentially dangerous students. So this is a real problem, right, in terms of like, and of course, in that situation, maybe one wanted more tells, but there are many other ways of solving the issue. And it's also coming into human resources departments that want to use AI to parse their applicants' expressions and gestures for nervousness, mood, and behavior patterns. So if you look at some forms of AI in hiring, they will make you do a three-minute interview. You talk to the interview into your phone, they record it, and then they parse the interview for how much you are like the people that they want at the firm, right? So this to me is a, a very alienating process. Ruha Benjamin has uh, critiqued it in her book, Race, Race After Technology, which I think is one of the, the smartest takes on this sort of problem. And I think that this is an issue where we really have to be careful about um, allowing the machine to just uh, stand in and to rationalize what may well just be an effort to clone the existing uh, staff, not on the basis of their qualifications, but just on the basis of things that really have nothing to do with the job at hand. Um, Laura, the concerns about bias are also really powerful. This is an article that's on SSRN, if you, if you are, want to found it. Uh, it's uh, Lauren Rue on um, the bias in these systems. She has found that black men's facial expressions are scored with emotions associated with threatening behaviors more often than white men, even when they are smiling. Okay? So this, to me, is a very problematic aspect of some of these, uh, these uh, uh, systems. And her work suggests that di biases documented in facial recognition may continue on in facial analysis. So we do know that in facial recognition, there's been letters written to Amazon and to Congress showing that their recognition system is much worse at recognizing many minority faces than majority faces of, of given a majority of minority ethnic groups. And this is also a reason why thousands of researchers have signed a letter to urge, re, urge, urge other researchers to stop inferring stigmatic predictors like criminality from face or body photos, right? This is the worry. Now, What's happening though, in response to this, is that many of the folks that run effective computing and do the research say, okay, we wanna make it better, okay? We'll allow it to do better. Um, just come and help us make it better. So I have mixed feelings about this. On the other hand, I'm glad that they are permeable and allow in other forms of expertise to help correct their biases. But what I worry about is that, I think that it reminds me a bit of the, the old Mark Twain story about Tom Sawyer where the story was that essentially Tom Sawyer had to paint a fence, and, but he tried to convince others that it was such a wonderful thing to do, and then he got all these other people to paint the fence for him. And I feel like there's a certain way in which there's an expectation of labor on behalf of the people marginalized by the affect of computing, which itself is problematic. And that leads to my question, should we really aim to fix affect of computing? I don't know. Um, I think not sometimes when I consider the privacy invasion. Okay, so now we've moved to box two. We were talking earlier about a failure to read emotion. Here we have excess reading of emotion being concerned about. And these are all examples. These first examples are from Jennifer Bard's article, Developing a Legal Framework for Regulating Emotion AI. She asks first, is it reading thoughts? Okay. Could the report of an emotion AI scan lead to a dismissal or discipline for insubordination? This is an interesting question, right? If you're on the Zoom, the boss says something ridiculous, your eyebrows, you know, you roll your eyes, et cetera. Is that something that may be parsed into, wow, that person doesn't seem to be a team player, right? Maybe there's a team player score, something like that. Um, is reading thoughts and feelings like listening in on private conversations? And what if the data that emotion AI collects is sensitive information, particularly if an emotional AI is trying to make some effort to determine mental health or mental states or mental health states, right? This in turn implicates many forms of privacy law that might say that this is a form of health data collection. Um, in the US, unfortunately, our health data law at the federal level is quite weak in the sense that it only covers hospitals, doctors, and healthcare providers and insurers. If anybody else is collecting health data, they're not regulated by that health law. But in many other jurisdictions, health data itself is a sensitive category, 
and could lead to certain forms of uh, higher scrutiny by regulators. So that I think you could even compare this. And I think these are, these are some of the reasons why privacy matters. I mean, as Neil Richards uh, asks in his, his book, he also wrote a great article called Intellectual Privacy. It talks about the need for us to be able to think freely without you know, immediately revealing what we think. Um, and I think I would make a final challenge to say that perhaps this is like, a, if they're doing mental health diagnoses via emotional AI without consent, it reminds me of doing mental health diagnoses without a license. And this became a controversy in the US when Barry Goldwater was running for president. Many psychologists wrote and said that they thought that he was insane. That was 1964, okay? Um, fast forward to 2016, uh, many were doing the same about Trump. But in the interim, the American Psychological Association said you really shouldn't do that. Okay, they said there's sort of a professional duty that you don't make di mental health diagnoses without having a personal confidential or personal professional relationship with someone. And so I think that there's something there. Um, I don't, and I think that if we're, if the APA is concerned about some of these very important figures, I mean, presidential candidates having this form of privacy and autonomy from that form of diagnosis, all the matter more, it may well apply to private individuals. Um, also, there's alienation. So this is our third category. Alienation or faulty writing of emotion, okay? Um, I, look, I, I wrote a book called New Laws of Robotics. I, I have tried to follow the field of robotics. One thing I'm fascinated by is the ever-expanding category of creepy robots, okay? And, and, and creepiness you know, is, is, is very contested as a term of evaluation or aesthetics. But I think it's useful. And I think that part of the core of the objection here is a sense perhaps that uh, of a potential replacement of persons by machines or a dehumanization of emotion, okay? And what I mean by a, a faulty writing of emotion is that, you know, if you look at this particular robot, I don't know if it's gonna be seen by all, but you know, there's, it's almost like it's trying too hard. I don't know. It's trying to look. <laughs> You know, it's got like this uh, sort of like a, a, a something like eyelids and, and eyes and, you know, it, it sort of is trying, but there's something about this where I think that there's, there's a certain level of a sense that there's a translation that was mistranslated, right? And I think that, you know, it, it, on some level, there, there are those out there that would say, well, it's, you, it's up to you to learn to be more cosmopolitan and to understand more expressions or appearances of emotions on the face of even machines, et cetera. But I think there's also objections there. I, I'm particularly inspired here by Mark Andreevich's Automated Media, where he describes the um, uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil, who is a believer in sort of the eventual evolution of persons into machines, um, trying to create a robotized version of his deceased father and insisting that it was actually more like his father than his father himself. Okay. And so this, I thought, was a very strange sort of insistence on, on, on that sort of uh, ability to translate, say, human experience, emotions, et cetera, into um, uh, the, the robot. I mean, I think that the robot like this is trying to induce feelings of, def of wanting to defend it, of wanting to help it. It's sort of appealing to acuteness, et cetera. And yet there's also sort of a way in which it alienates individuals who feel manipulated by that. And part of the core of this faulty writing of emotion critique is something that's aesthetic. I mean, it's very aesthetic, the sort of sense of was the performance of emotion by the robot something that we should believe and actually respond to, or is it something that we should feel repulsed by? You know, and I mean, particularly, you can think about this, for example, with like socialist realism. You know, if you watch a socialist realist show, a lot of times there's just sort of a sense in which you're you're you are supposed to feel identify identify and feel empathy with the protagonist. You know, a lot of people just feel like I'm I'm being trying they're trying to manipulate me. I don't like this. And I think what I'm trying to do in this talk is to create more space for the reaction of suspicion and the resistance to the manipulation, okay? I also, of course, the, the, the big, uh, uh, in the literature on robotics, the classic idea as to why, say, a robot like this wouldn't succeed is that the uncanny valley. The idea is that as human likeness increases in some object, some artifact, some machine, we first identify with it more and like it more, but then when it gets too close to us, we hate it, right? It's negative and then it's supposed to go way up when it finally bridges the gap and becomes utterly like a human being, right? And I think part of what I'm trying to say is like, I don't know if we necessarily should try to make this move. I think there's something wise about this particular um, gap and drop in uh, affect with response to particularly affective machines. Um, 
Why is evoking precise emotional responses so difficult? Well, complex emotions are not the rare or pathological case. They're common and often a sign of thoughtfulness, right? So, I mean, I think the immediate response to this robot that is desired is, oh, it's so cute, I wanna help it out, et cetera, right? But for everyone that says, oh, it's so cute or has some response to it in that way, there's also gonna be someone who just mocks that person and says, wow, I can't believe you were taken in by something so uh, uh, crude or so reductive or so silly looking. And that's, why, and, and that's one reason why I think that this effort to write emotions is often very difficult with affective computing because these complex emotions are often a sign of thoughtfulness. And even a clip like this, and I might say, I think I'll save it for the, the Q&A, but it's a, it's a very funny TikTok where um, KP Parker is, is making fun of other influencers. And as you watch her make fun of these influencers, essentially the idea is that um, you, uh, to me, I find it very funny, but other people may find it too mean, right? And so this question of like, is something funny? Is it mean? Is it this? Is it that? These are all really important, essential, contested questions. But I think we, do, we are wise to be alert to their complexity um, rather than simply allowing, say, um, uh, rather sort of falling in line with any given uh, uh, required response. Okay, today we're making my Gooby's recipe for sweet tea and why am I low key terrified? Let's go. What is this? Ew. Right. <laughs> right, and this is someone like, I, I could play the whole thing. I, I sorry, it was, it was a little too, too loud, so I didn't wanna um, uh, burden you with the whole thing. But you can sort of see that like this, there's a genre of TikToks where people sort of pretend to be fast, or they either, either sincerely are or pretend to be utterly fascinated and uh, mystified by the commonplace, okay? It's like there's these unboxing videos where someone would be like, a microphone, oh my gosh, a micro, I can't believe I got a microphone, right? And then, and, and this is like a big TikTok sort of uh, um, a genre. And then you have someone like her sort of coming in and saying, this is ridiculous. Like the people's sort of excess of emotion is sort of ridiculous. But you know, a proper response, whether what is the proper response to some mundane phenomenon is difficult. And even being able to sort of recognize this as a satire, some people will say only someone who's way too online would even post this or think about it. Others would say it's this person is hip to contemporary politics of affect, right? So the politics of affect I think are quite critical and will keep these things uh, in, you know, like, quite complex. Now finally, I'm gonna give you the example of what I think is the biggest problem and worry which again is of it working too well, right? So much of the literature is on affective computing not working, other is on it working too well. So modulation is an excess writing of emotion, right? And the concern here is that the success of affective computing can be more troubling than its failure. Um, this comes out of, for example, concerns about politics and the political uses of emotions. So Neil Postman, Brian Masumi, others have observed a shift from a politics of discourse to one of affect or in today's parlance, vibes, right? Who's got the vibes, the right vibe? Um, and Mano Sacris, in this article, wonderful article called Politics is Visceral, he's a professor of psychology, has identified the psychological concept of lexithymia as being really critical in terms of a problem where many people can't really express their feelings, particularly feelings of frustration about a political situation. And he worries that leaders that offer emotional prescriptions, such as you should feel X, or can label affects really well, can function as the context within, people, which, within which people construct new emotions, especially when we're interoceptively dysregulated, when we feel that we can't really understand the world around us or it's just very confusing. And I think there are real new horizons of emotional manipulation in politics thanks to A-B testing. I wrote a bit about this in an article called Facebook's Model Users, where I talked about both, there are people who use models at Facebook to identify how to structure the social media feed and how those in turn create model users, users who are engaged enough, who do more, who, who keep posting, who keep say, writing comments, et cetera. This A-B testing is really critical, right? Because we know that the Trump campaign, for example, was constantly testing via Facebook slightly, slight variations of different ads, right? So some would give you sort of sad Trump, right? <laughs> Here's the sad Trump. Here's the very heroic Trump. Right or I don't know maybe that Aunt Harmon, maybe that arm going up means something else. Uh, <laughs> here's the you know friendly Trump walking through a garden. Right, so with each of these type of variations, if you can test these at scale against individuals and figure out, for example, 
that um, say 45 year old uh, men who are working in the Rust Belt who feel uh, somewhat disenchanted, who have an uh, income of a certain level and a certain home situation like this one versus you know, people 20 to 35 and some demographic you know, who smoke and who do something else like this one versus another group that likes this one, you can very micro-target these types of ads to know exactly who to uh, bring them to. And this, this is where I think this difference between emotion and affect is very interesting because you don't necessarily need to have any particular articulable emotional response, but there is this sort of sense of like, who are people really resonating with? What image are people resonating with? And once you know those sort of resonant images, it becomes much easier to sort of pick the lock of contemporary politics, I think. You know? Now, of course, there are probably effects researchers that will uh, sort of come back and say, oh, it doesn't really have that much effect. But I think it's a hard effect to unpick because the problems are that someone may be conditioned in their behavior by continual exposure to the material. And so we need a lot of interaction, I think, between theorists and empiricists to sort of really think about how this works. Another example, you know, how are you gonna talk about the wall, right? You could say, no more games, wall, right? America's safety is at risk, or you know, keep Trump in it. So for the people, you might find that nobody responds to pictures of Trump, so then you bring in two more, and then you think about how to deal with that, right? So these, I think, are all examples where, you know, sorry, just to come back to, Trump, to this politics, all of these, I think, are examples where there are new horizons for potential of manipulation, but there are also new horizons for, um, and, and I don't know if these work for all political groups the same, right? It could be quite possible uh, thinking about some of, say, Jody Dean's work on communicative capitalism, that they work to activate some groups more and less others. And if that's the case, then you know, that would be, I think, a very interesting and troubling phenomenon, perhaps, about the future of affective computing in politics. Now, also, you know, we worry about the performance of obedience. Right? If, for example, there are uh, ways in which one reacts, and you know that the way that you react could be a trigger for future screening, the idea may be that you try to act as normal as possible. I had a, a, a very silly example of this recently. I'm just coming into the country here. Um, I just came up to the computer, it didn't recognize me, and finally told, someone told me, you've got to bend down like this, right? Says I was too tall for it. But there are many people that you know, have different affects that might be suspicious to the computing system. So if you know that an affect could be suspicious to the computing system, then the pressure is to act more and more like a normalized version of oneself or a normalized uh, uh, passenger going through the airport. And Kate Crawford has written about this. Um, others have written, I think, quite convincingly that that can lead to a certain narrowing of certain forms of behavior in the wake of the computer. And it reminds me of Elizabeth Noel Neumann's classic work on the spiral of silence, which is the idea, that her idea was that people would talk less and less freely about what they believed in as they felt that there was more of a, a, a line that they had to follow. And that the more people followed the line, the less people were around to even contradict it. You know? So that, I think, is one problem is this, does affective computing re require a performance of obedience? Another example is, you know, there are some emancipatory accounts of affective computing. I mean, Ron Al-Khalibi, remember when I talked earlier about the possibility of someone being fired for you know, rolling their eyes? She's brought up the possibility that maybe that would be used against the manager, so that if the manager bored people, that manager would be punished for boring them. Right? So that's potentially emancipatory. But I also feel that you know, there's a real problem here with respect to you know, using faces and capturing emotional responses and generating an engagement score. Because I think that there's a real effort by these scores to you know, try to control uh, work customers and patients, workers and students with stimuli until they react with the desired response. And that to me is, is a concern. I mean, it's really dramatized by this uh, patent application for how to end a commercial. Okay? So in this patent application, Someone's watching TV at stage one, and then there's a commercial, and it says, say McDonald's and the commercial, jump up and say McDonald's, then the, the program continues, right? But of course, this is a lot like YouTube's, like, you know, five seconds into the ad, you hit the five second thing, right? So this, I think, is very important to consider how modulation could occur, because there are now things, uh, proposed Zoom engagement scores, okay? <laughs> so this, uh, this image, I have to thank L.M. Sakasas for this great image from his article, A Theory of Zoom Fatigue. But the idea here is that we would be able to measure how engaged people are on Zoom. So this keeps people looking, right? Because there's a concern of, say, a spiral of people just blacking out their screen. So this would be trying to go in the opposite direction, of everyone looking as engaged as they can. <laughs> <laughs>
go. And, and this, this, it's remarkable to me that that has been proposed. There was immediately protest against it. Um, it also reminds me a bit of a system called class care that uh, two Chinese companies, one called Hanlong and some called Hikvision, instituted in uh, schools with about 36,000 students, where they would take a picture of each student's face. Um, one system was every second, and the other was every minute. They could then rank the students by engagement, and then rank every class by who was the most engaged students, then rank all the classes by the average of engagement of the students. Okay? Now, this is one of those areas where the Chinese government did not censor critiques of this. I think even people within at the top sensed that this was going too far. And on Weibo, there was a hashtag called, hashtag, thank God I graduated already. Right? <laughs> because people just felt this is going too far. Right? But I think that this is, uh, I think that the problems with these is they're adding affective to cognitive labor. Right? There's a real pressure here to, to not only do the work, but also to look like you enjoy doing the work. And, <laughs> and, th and this, I think, should be something we watch out for. Right? Because I think that it's something that, on the one hand, Maybe it leads to more social harmony. It could. And you know, given all the disharmony in the US, I'm sometimes open to that argument. But I also feel that there's a real problem in terms of the power differentials that are encoded here. Okay? And one regulatory proposal that I love, that I, I just gave a presentation to the European Trades Unions Institute on, is the California's Workplace Technology Accountability Act, which essentially says that if something like this is, in, is imposed on the workplace, that any workers that it's imposed on be able to respond to, uh, to contribute to it, to vet it, to audit it, et cetera. And so that's sort of a, a possibility out there. And my general tip is that if you're interested in the sort of law in America and regulating technology, look to California, look to New York, uh, look to California, Federal Trade Commission, et cetera. Not much going on in the, in the uh, Congress, I think, that's gonna get passed. But California is really taking some interesting moves here. Um, of course, that's just, sorry, that's just proposed. It's not actually done. Okay, so now, I was called five critiques of affective computing. What's number five? Okay, so we could say, uh, so, uh, someone, I'm sure there's someone in the audience thinking, wait a second, you're saying it's bad if it does work and it's bad if it doesn't work, right? You're saying, it could, you're, you're trying to create this dichotomy where you're critiquing it for being way too advanced and not at all advanced enough. So why can't we find a happy medium, right? Why can't we find the happy medium behind risk, risk misrecognition and privacy invasion and between um, alienation and modulation, right? And I think that's gonna be hard to do though. And here's the fifth critique, okay? The fifth critique I draw from Cien Ney's book, The Theory of the Gimmick, okay? And I think this is a wonderful book that sort of combines insights about aesthetic response and moral judgment. And a lot of what I've been talking about today, I can think of another objection where someone says, don't yuck my yum, you know? Which essentially means I like what the computer's doing, you're saying yuck, I don't like it, and it's just an aesthetic response. If I have an aesthetic response and you have an aesthetic response. But what Nye tries to demonstrate, or does, I think, demonstrate in this book, is that a lot of times our aesthetic judgments are really bound up in larger theories of how society should look and larger ethical theories. And what, uh, what she does, I think, particularly well, is she looks at gimmicks in various novels, art, film, et cetera, and notes that you know, sometimes the gimmick is a device that strikes us as working too hard, and sometimes gimmicks in these works is a device that strikes us as works too little. Sometimes it's outdated and backwards, sometimes it's newfangled and futuristics, sometimes it saves labor, sometimes it creates more labor. I think this is a problem with affective computing is too. I think that it's sort, of, it's sort of a gimmick, it's sort of this gimmicky way of getting us to buy into a larger narrative about the exceptional power of computing, of the idea that artificial general intelligence or human-like robots are just around the corner, and that we, for that to be true, we must be complicit in it, right? to be somewhat complicit in it. And I think that that idea of complicity is really at the core of, uh, of a fifth critique of effective computing. Now, these may well be irreconcilable contradictions, right? And this is where she develops out of a critique of capitalism, the, the critique of the gimmick develops out of a critique of capitalism, where she says that essentially this features index the fundamental contradictions. Proliferation of labor-saving devices in tandem with an intensification of human labor. Okay, we've all seen that, right? Um, and increase of productivity in tandem with less of a, lesser availability of secure work, and both planned obsolescence and routinized innovation, right? And I, I bring up the law and political economy project here because I think that part of what I'm trying to do here is to bring together work of humanities and social sciences into the policy realm. As I mentioned earlier, with respect to Jennifer Bard's work and some other work, there's incredibly important work now being done on how to re regulate affective computing. 
But I think some of the work too easily uh, presumes, and I'm not saying this about Bard's work, but I think some of the policy work in general about affective computing presumes that it is the role of the reformer and the person intervening and the activist to help those behind computation and affective computing perfect what they're doing and make it better and better. And I think that the critiques that I brought in here, and I think uh, Nay's uh, sort of insights here, give us a sense that sometimes, you know, we don't really want to make it better. Sometimes we just want to limit its use, right? And so that leads to my concluding thoughts today, which is that AI hype is a major problem. Uh, Deb Raji is a, is a great scholar, and she and some co-authors wrote, uh, did an article at uh, the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency Conference in Seoul uh, earlier this year, talking about how many bits, pieces of AI that supposedly work in some way don't work at all. And that gets into our critique of, a, of effective computing just not working or working very faultily, right? And perhaps the best defense against affective computing's incursion into our emotional lives is to treat it as a gimmick. You know, if you see the pepper robot and it smiles at you, um, I don't think you need to make an effort to create a deep emotional connection with the robot, right? <laughs> I think instead, maybe just walk, roll your eyes and walk by it, right? And I think that's the lesson of different books. I mean, I'm particularly inspired by Meredith Broussard's Artificial Unintelligence, which I think really did a great job and was quite prescient in predicting the difficulties of getting autonomous vehicles. I mean, she was very, very ahead of the curve in sort of saying, this is a much bigger social problem than it is a technical problem, and there's gonna be a lot of difficulty in getting these forward, and she was right. And a recent book, it's just coming out in an English translation in October called Awkward Intelligence by Katarina Zweig, where she talks about how AI can go wrong, where it matters, et cetera. And then the, the last chapter of my book uh, from 2020 goes into great detail about further explaining sort of my, my sense of the, of the uh, relationship between aesthetics and moral judgments when it comes to advanced technology. Uh, because I, I really am committed to this idea that the humanities have a lot to say about our ethical and policy responses to technology. So someday perhaps, effective computing may be treated like a magic eight ball or fortune teller. I think that will be a positive future, I hope. Um, in the meantime, we've got to get regulation and monitoring. And what I'll leave you with tonight is that we either interrogate the emotion machines or they will endlessly interrogate and interpolate, sort of create identities for us. So that, thank you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Should I stay up for questions? Yeah, or? Oh, I great. Think so. okay, yeah. we'll thanks, yes. thanks so much, Frank. So um, that was a wonderful talk. And we, we, I think we'll take a few, few minutes for questions. So, um, sorry. Stop there. <laughs> who, who, has a, who, who has a question for Frank? And we'll, we'll bring a microphone around to you. Maybe Oops. while <laughs> there is a question out the front. Thanks. I'll uh, hand the mic yeah. straight. Thanks. That, that, was, that was really great. Let me take you to the, the, the point you ended on. And oh, I guess sure. the question is, um, I think what you, the, the, the link you make with the idea of the gimmick is really mm -hmm. important there. And I get that. But in a sense, is that not in fact part of the insidiousness and the danger of it? Because the gimmick is also something that's quite facile. Mm. It actually delivers a lot without a lot of effort on the part of the person receiving the gimmick or getting pleasure out of the gimmick. And it seems to me that that's actually really part of the danger here that so much is given up in the social media sphere um, effectively for what is, in effect, very limited reward, but it's a reward nonetheless that people really like and want. So there's a, a similar kind of, I guess you could say, erotics in terms of the gimmick and what it delivers and what social media is delivering, um, except with, with this one in the social media sphere or, or, or other spheres in this space, it comes at a real price in terms of the kinds of information and liberties potentially that are, that are surrendered. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up, that angle on it, because I agree. I mean, if, if I were to think further about, you know, Cambridge Analytica and how they developed psychological profiles of voters off of Facebook, some of it was these really strange little quizzes that would be like, you know, I'm going to give you a quiz of five answers, and then I'll give you a, a, a score on it or a smiley face or something along those lines. And I think that out of those sort of uh, gimmicky interventions to gather data, a lot of harm can be done because you know, people don't realize the degree to which very small pieces of data that they give up daily can be put into a mosaic that, that creates a really detailed and invasive and intrusive picture of their lives. 
You know, and, and I, I think that that is part of the issue here is that um, the gimmickiness of it, uh, I agree with you, it's on some level, I'm trying to use the gimmick designation as a defense, but on the other hand, it really does serve to underscore the power of a lot of these entities. And I think particularly there was this story about a hitchhiking robot that was going across, and the, the, con the, <laughs> and the comparison was, you know, between, like in Canada, there was, uh, in Canada, the hitchhiking robot, everyone sort of helped it along the way. Uh, in America, 12 miles in, it was kicked to the curb and <laughs> destroyed. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and, and I don't want to be seen as, you know, a, a um, doctrinaire, jingoistic American here, but I want to defend the people that kicked away because, you know, I think on some level they may have felt like this is too cheap a gimmick, right? This is just like, you, you think that you put a smiling face on a robot and I'm not going to apprehend it with some level of fear. Um, and, and there's actually even an article by uh, Frumkin and Colangelo called uh, Self-Defense Against Robots. The idea being that if a drone comes to your yard, they believe that you should have the right to just shoot it down. Of course, of course that's a, another pathological uh, response. But, <laughs> you know, but, but, I, but I think it's, it's interesting to sort of feel like, at the very least, what that leads to is how do we create a world where you know, we're not trying to gimmick people into thinking the robot is here to help me by putting a smiling face on it. Or an example that we were talking about earlier this afternoon, a uh, really fascinating example, was apparently during the robo uh, 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 development by Centerlink, they would develop uh, user interfaces that would be pleasing colors and that would use the first name of the person addressed, you know, in order to make them feel better about the process, right? And so this to me is, is you know, an effort where we can sort of question the gimmick and we can be sort of uh, uh, alluded to it, but you're right, it gets a lot with a little and that's the whole key to it. I think we have time for yeah one or two more questions if people have them. Are we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for that fantastic talk. That was oh, really wonderful. Thanks. I kept thinking about um, when you were talking about the relationship between human emotions and emotional machines about Ian Hacking's idea of feedback loops <sighs> that that when there is his thinking of the, the history of medicine, and so when a medical diagnosis appears, you have all these people who begin to identify without being diagnosed as having that medical condition, and that will then change the, the way that the diagnosis itself is framed and understood. So there's a loop between the two. And you were talking a lot about like the Zoom engagement scores. And, and I was thinking, you know, the, the, one of the horrors for me over the last couple of years is watching my own face in meetings all of the yes. time and discovering like you, Frank, that I have no poker face. <laughs> and, yes. and, and this is not necessarily a good thing to discover yeah. in a work meeting. And so there is a training that goes on that has nothing to do with engagement scores, which as far as I'm aware do not exist <laughs> in this <laughs> university. But there is a loop between seeing yourself and then thinking, oh, I better smile, you know, yes. when I'm in the yes. meeting, so I look pleasant, you know, for the people yes. who are talking. That's a different kind of training that yes. goes on between those two, in which it's not that we have human emotions on the one hand and machines who are regulating that on the other, but we're now in an effective economy in yes. which they are part of our loop. So I wonder how that fits into this kind of schema that you're looking at here. I think that's uh, such a fascinating observation, and you're absolutely right. On some level, what we've already all experienced is in some ways more chilling than the engagement score, right? Because we've sort of are, are, are like suddenly self-surveilling to such a great extent. And it reminds me of that old saying that you can only manage what you can measure. But then the, the entailment also might be that once you start measuring, you start managing, right? And I think that that to me is, and once you, you're able to have this data about the self, and I do like the idea of the looping kinds out of, uh, out of hacking. And I think you're right to say that this is, this is the, the creation of this information is not sort of just an objective, empirical academic process that you know, leads to more information about the world being created. There is some sort of uh, effects that are coming out of it. You know? I mean, and I won't go so far as, as uh, you know, Flusser or, or others you know, that might be more techno-determinist, but I do think that there are definitely uh, controlling effects and it would be really interesting if people have the videos to, consort, since, to compare over time the diversity of responses in Zoom meetings at the beginning of the pandemic when it's still new to now, where it's like it's old hat, right? And then where people have sort of found a certain way to be. There is, of course, the option of turning off self-view, which I think everyone tells you to do, but I'm like, I don't know. You know, it's, like, it's, just, it's, it's very sort of like, you, one worries about like what exactly is, uh, is, is, is I, am I telling essentially here? And the other thing that's fascinating coming out of the theory of Zoom fatigue article 
is that in ordinary interaction, you know, if you're at a meal with someone or even in a classroom, it's like maybe you see, uh, there's just so much more restricted vision. Whereas like on that screen, it's not only everyone can see each other, but it's being recorded often, you know, or something can, it could be recorded. And that creates a whole other dynamic. So I, I think you're right to say that this sort of like micro, maybe ethnomethodology or sort of like uh, uh, phenomenology or uh, observation of what's going on would really help in terms of uh, maybe developing interfaces that are better. The sad thing is that I do know people that have tried to develop like second life-like interfaces that are supposed to have more of the affordances of actual in-person communication. But um, this is where, you know, my, it's hard to try to get everyone online to one of those. So yeah, yeah, so I think we, sometimes you just, a monopoly happens and then we, we all adapt to it. But yeah, thanks. I think time for one more question, if, if there is, if, if there is one. There is, right up in the back. I'll come up to you, Grant. Yeah, my, my, my question's really about <coughs> how much history is involved <laughs> in these kind of, of um, enterprises in trying to, to deal with facial rec recognition and, and configure some idea of, um, <coughs> of people's character. You know, you look back in 19th century criminology, looking at physiognomy as a way of tracking criminality <coughs> and you look at the experiments in film theory in the in the 20s uh, where the, the Kuleshov experiments where they put a person's face against a plate of food everyone reading the, those two photos think that they're looking at somebody who's hungry put it against a, was it a coffin I think I remember and they're sad ah, and then yeah, <coughs> an yeah. example you won't have heard of but, but one that will amuse you I guess is there's a, there's a, a music quiz show on television called Spicks and Specs, and one of their, one of their little <coughs> segments involves ha showing two photographs of two people <laughs> to the panel, and they have to guess whether they're a serial killer or a musician. <laughs> <laughs> and they find that really hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> what if it's Marilyn Manson? I mean, you know, it's, it's a, <laughs> yeah. No, I think, that's not a, but it's a, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. I think that's a, it's a very sort of, you know, I, I like your idea of rooting this in history, because yeah, it's not new, right? None of this stuff is new. You know, it's like it's it's uh, it goes back to. I, I'm sad to say I was at the University of Pavia early, or Pavia earlier this year, and there was a statue to Cesar Lombroso, who I think was at the start of some of this physi physiognomy stuff, and uh, uh, and and there was a recent article by Wu and Zhang called uh, "Inferring Criminality Based on Faces: Infer Inference of Criminality from Facial Images." So. These ideas keep coming back. I think the one positive thing I can say about the current environment is that there are many people that do have that historical awareness. And I, I'm glad that you brought it up and I'm glad that others are, are starting to protest and to say, look, we've tried this before and it had some bad results and we don't wanna go down this road of classifying people biometrically or by face type or whatever it is again. Um, I hope to see more of that resistance, part of why I am working on a book now called the, the Digitization of Judgment, is I want to try to create this sort of firewall between efforts to use AI and machine learning to control the natural world and to control, predict, stigmatize uh, uh, people. Because I think that that's where um, we have to slow down that stuff, first of all. And that secondly, there needs to be sort of a human in the loop if, if that is ever being used. So, yeah, so I, I'm glad you bring up the history and um, I need to go back further into the history to sort of really tell the story of affective computing because oftentimes the story starts in the 1990s with Rosalind Picard at MIT Media Lab. But I think there's actually probably a lot more behind that story, going back at least to, to Weizenbaum's Eliza Rogerian psychotherapist that you know, would be necessarily part of the story of affective computing. That's really helpful, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Frank, and uh, it's been wonderful to have you here to launch Digital Cultures and Societies this evening. And I'm going to come over here because oh. we have a, uh, a gift. Excellent. All yeah. right. As a thank you for coming to speak. Uh, and please join me in thank you. <laughs> Uh, thanks to all of you for coming along, and please stay and join us for uh, drinks and snacks uh, uh, this evening here in the room. Um, and um, we hope to see you and hope to connect with you at Digital Culture and Societies over and over again <laughs> over the next several years. <laughs> thanks, everyone. <laughs>